The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Open your Bibles to 2 Peter. <clears throat> we're uh, on Wednesday night, we're talking about missionary evangelism. And uh, this is a passage I want to read. 2 Peter 2. <clears throat> because my topic tonight is dispensational, dispensational missionary evangelism and, and Peter talks about it in 2nd Peter 2 4 through 10 remember my topic is dispensational missionary evangelism <clears throat> you can see that this subject actually began in eternity past in verse 4 if God did not spare angels when they sinned and cast them into hell and committed them into pits of darkness reserved for judgment, then he moves to another that becomes now dispensational for us and did not spare the ancient world. <clears throat> That's the world of we call the Gentile age. And did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others. There's your missionary evangelist when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Then we get into the Jewish age with Abraham and Lot. Say so we've just moved from the Gentile age with Noah. If he, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, have he made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter? If he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day with their lawless deeds. I can really relate to that today. I mean, the news and, and just people you know that give you stories I mean, we are, we are a culture of eating our young, not literally, but figuratively. And, and, and uh, I mean, I just, it just, I just, it, I understand torment your soul. Then the Lord knows how, how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under judgment, under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authorities, daring self-will, they do not tremble when they revile ange angelic mass. And then he gets into a whole nother part. I, I wanted to call your attention to that because there's a great outline here <clears throat> of the concept of, um, well, you might say, ageless missionary evangelism. But... Uh, we're calling it dispensational because he walks you through here through the first nine verses. He walks you through that. And then he, he brings the reality to his life and his ministry as he goes on with the subject matter. So let's open with a word of prayer. <clears throat> classroom etiquette for those who are with us in our normal classroom setting. Know the procedure, the importance of of your indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people that is born again and spiritual in that they are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and need to be sure that they're under his ministry of enlightenment on the learning part and walking by his power in the application of it in the living part. Now that's going to work both in the learning and the living by you confessing sin. 
1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. That is, if, you're there, if there's evidence in your life, it's due to carnality. That's an exercise of carnality. Then to get out of carnality and into spirituality, you apply 1 John 1, 9 because it's a verse about sanctification, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. It could be mental attitude, sins, sins, tongue, avert sins. That would be three categories at least for you to consider. And through your priesthood, make confessions and we'll begin our study. You do it in silence and privacy, but you need to do that exercise. And so our Father, we're thankful today for these who have come visit with us, to study with us by the internet and by the automobile. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God, which He will, through the enlightenment of our souls spiritually. He will teach us great truths that will set us free from the cosmic system of confusion and distractions and will zero in on our walk with the Lord, the dynamics of it in our everyday life what a privilege to walk every day in the presence of the Lord. Don't have to wait till we die and go to heaven. I mean, this is the dynamics of the Christian life. Every day having enormous experiences of great ministry, prayer life, all these things that come through the dynamics of fellowship, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. We thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Our lesson text was interesting. I chose that to talk about this subject matter because in verse 4, it goes back to eternity past with angels. We, we referred to that out of Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 26 as the revolt of, revolt of the devils. And then over into Revelation 12, that subject is picked up. Then in that verse 4, then in verse 5, he moves to the ancient world. That is the world before the flood. After the flood, it's called the present world. Uh, the ancient world up to the flood time. And that takes us into the Gentile age. And then on the, that first half, the second half of that is the Gentile age takes us into the Abraham. And that takes us into the Jewish age. But... In verse 5, he takes us into the ancient world. Uh, and then in verses 6 through 8, with uh, Sodom, uh, the ungodly of Sodom and Gomorrah, he takes us into the Jewish age with Abraham. And then he gives us an, a, an ageless doctrinal principle. Look at verse 9 and 10 in, in this passage. The Lord knows, and, and if he knows and has revealed it, then we know. Right? It's been revealed to us in his word. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under judgment for the uh, punishment for the day of judgment. And then he goes on in verse 10 and explains it more. So that's a, I mean, that's an ageless doctrinal principle of why we evangelize. Mm -hmm. And then in 2 Peter in the third chapter, we're in the second chapter here. In the third chapter, verse 9, notice he says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. slowness. And I suppose we all do <laughs> because of expectations, right? I mean, it's just human nature. But human nature has to be taught to wait on the Lord, doesn't it? Doesn't it? And he's going to teach you that lesson. So the quicker we learn it, the better, better off we will be with what's going on in our life. <clears throat> the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And if you, when you begin to study the Bible in details, you see this principle over and over and over again. Um, now, for example, we've been studying Daniel. 
those captives under 70, 70 years of, of sla sla slavery, of POW status, no matter how good it got, it's still, you still was a slave, weren't you? Joseph was still a slave, no matter what he was, he was still a slave. He was still a foreigner and an outsider. He, he, listen, he was reminded every day by the Lord when he had to eat separate. He, he ranked second in command, still had to eat separate because the Egyptian couldn't eat with him, kind of like the Jews later weren't. weren't. See, it seemed like they'd realize that, wouldn't they? Well, anyhow. Um, <clears throat> the Lord is not slow about it, as, as people call but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And that is the character of God. And that is the character of God that drives us to missionary evangelism. It's what, whether you're a home missionary, like many of us, or you're a foreign mission, missionary, like some of you, this is how we operate. I mean, this is why we share our neighbors, why we talk to our family members who we don't think have a walk with God. This is why we do this, because we understand the heart of God. Right? I mean, and that's why we, you know, that's why sometimes we enter into uncomfortable situations because it's so important we share the truth of the Word of God to a person that we know needs to hear it. And sometimes it's a very uncomfortable, and sometimes it puts our relationship and our family or our neighbors or our close friends in a tough place, doesn't it? And still, when God put, the Holy Spirit puts that on your heart, you know you've got to do that. And, and listen, when you do that, you share the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't try to convince them. It's not your job to convince people. Your job is to share them, make sure that the gospel is clear. It's up to the Holy Spirit and God to save it. It's, listen, Listen, in, in this passage, the Lord is not slow about his promise. He is patient, not wishing that any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Listen, he's heavily engaged in this idea. He just wants you to go, when he tells you to talk to somebody, you've got to believe, no matter how, my, how bad it might think you might feel uncomfortable, you've got to do it. And I'll tell you why. Because he, he in his slow promises, and patience. You know those two P words? What he's doing is he's preparing, no telling how long to get that person at that place where they have ears to hear. And listen, he's going to send somebody. He'd like it to be you because it's personal. And it may be, may be your turn to sow it. It may be your t turn to cultivate it or water it. Or it may be your turn to harvest it. It doesn't matter. It's a key moment. Right? It's so important to do that. <clears throat> Whether you're on home missions or foreign missions. Ezekiel. I find this, when, when I was doing Daniel and everything, of course, I've heard this before, but I got interested in Jeremiah on one side and Ezekiel on the other side of Daniel. So I went back and looked at these guys because I thought this is, this is really interesting. I mean, God, he raised up three people at the same time that were giants for him, right? So you know something big's going on. So I got really interested because Jeremiah sat on the homeland side, and then God sent Ezekiel in there to support Daniel in, in the work as it began to get greater. So my point is, God sets a whole lot of stuff up for you. All you got to do is go knock on that person's heart door and share the truth of the word of God with them. And let the Lord do what he's done. He's already set up to do. But anyhow, Ezekiel, he mentions three missionary evangelists. 
He mentions three. And I believe that's what he's doing because that's what Ezekiel's doing. All right? When you read the book of Ezekiel, you got a missionary book. When you read Jeremiah, you got a missionary book. When you read Daniel, you got a missionary book. I mean, these guys are in the thick of it. But in Ezekiel 14, 14, it's interesting, the three guys that were picked. He picked Noah, Daniel, and Job in that order. Now, that wouldn't be the normal order. The normal order would probably be something like Noah. It might, might even be Job, Noah, and Daniel. Right? But he did, didn't do it. But he did mention the three. And he, and, he, and he apparently put them in an order of importance to the exiles and, and the, the people there that, listen, I didn't send you into Babylon to whine and cry. I sent you to be the light to the Gentiles. Isaiah 42.6. Isaiah 49.6. I didn't send you in there to sit around and whine and cry because you're in the hospital. That's Chuck Farmer. I learned that from him. I mean, he was all over this Isaiah 42. I didn't send you to the hospital to sit there and cry and moan and groan. I sent you to be a light to the Gentiles. I sent you to be a light to the world. And uh, that's impacted my whole family. I mean, nobody in my family goes to the hospital except, except under, under that principle of, we call it the Chuck Farmer principle. Um. Uh, because we found it just like him to be an absolute truth. So he, he says, Ezekiel 14, 14, he says, even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, Job, were in, if, if, if they were, if, even though these three men were in its midst, that's the fifth cycle of divine discipline, by their own righteousness, they could not deliver themselves. You know why? Because this is a collective discipline, isn't it? And one got, once they violated the, and God put the hammer down, there was nothing stopping it. And he said, although these are, are the top missionary guys, these were the top righteous people of their day, they couldn't have stopped it. They could not deliver themselves declares the Lord. That's the, that's the power of the fifth under Babylon in, in, to this guy. Now, the interesting reason he picked these guys is Jonah was that guy, and he couldn't stop the flood. All he could do is build an ark and preach. Couldn't stop it. God was going to bring judgment. He said, I'm bringing judgment on the world. Right? So he picks them because he feels like he's in a small category of that. Then Daniel, yeah, swept up Daniel. God swept up Daniel. Now the key is, what are you going to do with it? You're going to say, oh, the world is going to be destroyed. And Jonah didn't sit down. God, he just kept working. He kept working and preaching, right? Noah. I mean Noah. Noah. He was talking about Jonah. I know. <laughs> if I say Jonah and I'm in, just forget it. Uh, do what? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyhow, uh, anyhow, I, did, I just, and these guys, he picked these guys just like he, God picks us. Now, Ezekiel picked them because he, he, could, he felt he could relate and he felt the exiles could and how important their life should be as a light. I mean, God controls our circumstances, Right? I mean, we, we believe that. And, and how important it is to not miss opportunities when they come that. Because sometimes we look at the circumstances that created the opportunity and it outweighs in our minds the importance of the opportunity. You know what I'm saying? Well, look, all of a sudden you're like Rhonda. She's in a car wreck. She didn't, I mean, she's just driving down work and all of a sudden she got hit out of the wild blue. Man, man, just, no, eh? So she goes to the hospital. She goes like, 
God's got up, God's up to something here. I was going to go to school to minister today, but now I'm in the hospital to minister. So won't this be interesting? Maybe it's just the way you, you view stuff. Just the way you view it. That's the way we ought to view it. When we could say, oh, look, I got it. My, my chest bone's broke, and I'm that, says, and I'm that. You could do that. You could do that. Or you could say, well, apparently God allowed this for something bigger than what I see, so I'm going to get my eyes off the hospital, off, off the car wreck, and I'm going to put it on why I'm here. Hooah. I mean, why can't we do that on little things so that when big things you know, there are no little and big things, but in our mind that, you know, the little things be successful with them. So when the big things come, we, we're in a good habit. We're in a good pattern. That's, what, that's the way I think, but what do I know? It is interesting that, that under the old covenant, we have two dispensations. Under the old covenant, we have two dispensations, Gentile age and the Jewish age. Under the New Covenant, we have two dispensations, the Church Age and Millennial Age. I just find that really interesting. <laughs> and so, point number one, the big question would be, at least for me, how were people saved under the Old Covenant, New Covenant? How were people saved? And uh, same way. <laughs> Kind of, huh? Kind of the same way. I mean, there's only one cross and only one person is qualified to climb on it and out of that comes the atonement for the sins of the world, right? John, John 1, 29, for the sin of the world, the Lamb of God that's come away to take the sin of the world. But, you know, there was sin before there was sin. You know, in our, in our mind, because... 2 Peter 2, 4 says the angels sinned and were judged. You see? But for us, it's Adamic sin. But I, 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 so, you know, sin is not something new that man just come up with. In fact, man, man never wants to call it that. The world never calls sin, sin. When's the last time? I mean, they call addiction, what do they call it? A disease. <laughs> I know, but hey, listen, they don't know better. I don't poo-hoo them on that. When the church says that, then I get upset. But when the world says it, I go like, well, they need me to go by and talk to them. So when the church says it, I get upset. I don't get upset when the world is doing all this crazy stuff. I'd have done a lot of crazy stuff if I hadn't had some pretty strong people in the family. They'd come and get me in the middle of the night. He said, I told you to be home at 10. They'd come hunt me down and get me. Of course, it was easy where I grew up. One street, one light. And we thought it was really good when we got that one light because then by then we only had two stop signs, one at one end and one at the other. And then the police made us stop going around because, we, you know, we do that U-turn Right? Then they put up a sign, no U-turns, and then they enforced it, and it messed up all of our Saturday night fun. That's about the most fun we had, William, right there. Make it a U-turn? Yeah, being able to be in a car and make a U-turn and have that sleeve rolled up and like that, you remember, huh? Yeah. It, Did you have a pack of cigarettes? No. <laughs> I was waiting for the cigarette part. <laughs> Did have a knob on the steering wheel, though. I did have that. Here's Paul's answer to the question about how were people saved under the Old Covenant and New Covenant. Paul's answer, the Scriptures. The Scriptures foreseen that God, the Scriptures foreseen that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all nations will be blessed in you. Abraham, therefore, is supposed to take the message of the gospel to the Gentiles, isn't he? Now, he should understand that because he was one, right? He was a Shemite. 
There was nothing bad then about a Gentile. A Gentile could be saved or not saved. Then the Jews got crazy about that. And if you're not a Jew, you know. <laughs> but as they say in the beginning, <laughs> the Scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, so Abraham would have it to preach to the Gentiles. And, and uh, he did it out of Genesis 12.3, and I think this is interesting. You know, that's where the Abrahamic covenant is established, but where it's really preached is by Isaac, uh, is by um, Abraham taking Isaac on the mountain in the 22nd chapter of Genesis, verse 18, and makes that statement. All nations will be blessed. I think that's a pretty powerful idea. Then in Galatians, these two verses in Galatians, I really love when I come to this subject because in verse 8, it says that Abraham believed the gospel and was saved. And verse 16 says, and the seed was Christ and goes into an explanation about it. Boy, if you think you're going to get saved any other way than Christ, you're mistaken. And if you think that you can slide through this world, die, and not go to hell, <laughs> you're wrong. And the only way not to is to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, and when you believe it, you're in. You are in. You got the passport signed, sealed, and delivered. And without that, you're going where you know you're going. Under the old covenant, under the old covenant, the Gentiles and the Jewish dispensation, the Gentile and Jewish dispensations, had the same, and this is really important in my opinion, had the same categorized Hebrew Bible called the Scriptures. I was in a discussion with somebody there, they have preacher or anything. Just didn't understand this. And, uh, and, and, you know, you just, after a while, you just have a cup of coffee and you tell them what you believe and they show them the Word of God. And, and then you leave it alone, you know. And they wanted to fuss some more. I went, no, I'm through. Let's just sit and talk about something. If, I mean, if we, we don't want to talk about this. We can talk about something else. But listen, the scriptures with a capital S, if you look this up in the Bible, you're going to, if you look, if you get a good concordance, look this up, you're going to find something really interesting about this because when that has a capital S, it's all Old Covenant. It's the canonization of the Old Covenant Bible, which was written in Hebrew. I mean, every time. The scriptures. Listen, from Genesis to Malachi is the Old Covenant, Gen all the way from Genesis to Malachi until the Incarnation. Then in, Ma in John 5, Jesus tells them about this. He says, you search the Scriptures, you Jews, talk about their canonization of the Bible, you search the Scriptures and can't find eternal life because you don't believe in, in Christ. Eternal life is in Christ. You search the Bible, you, stay, you don't pay any attention to Christ, and he's the answer to eternal life. <laughs> the scriptures he was talking about was the Bible they were carrying around. They paid no attention to Christ about it. The scriptures, called the Old Testament, is used this way throughout the development of the church age until John and the book of Revelation are closed, and the canonization of the New Testament takes place. I'm talking about Matthew to Revelation. When you read the scriptures in there, they're talking about the Old Covenant because the New Covenant hasn't been canonized. <clears throat> Has been canonized. So we take the same principle of canonization that's in the Old Covenant and carry it to the New Covenant. I mean, we talk about these passages where that's described in there. Um, the four Gospels, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, 2 Timothy, James, 1 and 2 Peter is where you're going to find this, capital S's. 
These guys are all teaching out of their canonized scripture and calling it that. Later, the church will come in existence with the new covenant, and we preach it that way. And we use them as a reference to preach it that way, and rightly so. Makes the Jews uncomfortable. Because they don't think that we have the scriptures like they had them. They just had them first. Same with Christ. You had them first. You threw them away. We got them. Right? John 1, 11 through 13. He came to his own. His own didn't receive him. But to as many as receive him. Right? Boom. Paul says in Acts, the 13th chapter, I came to you. You keep throwing the gospel away. You want a Bible without Christ. There's no such thing. So I'm going to the Gentiles. I'm supposed to take it to them anyhow. I'm supposed to be preaching the light of Christ to the Gentiles. I'm going to them because you people don't give a hoot. Some, or something like that. <laughs> I'm not quite sure whether it was a hoot. It was something like a hoot. It is interesting to me when you look at Luke's account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ and you run the trail of the genealogy of Christ. He runs it, he runs it all the way back to Adam. Therefore, he's covering the Gentile age and the Jewish age to the incar all the way to the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Because that's what genealogy is. Genealogy is to bring the incarnation to history. When you read all those names, and I know that the average person wouldn't, you'll find 75. In this Luke account, they link the genealogy of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles and through the Gentiles, to the Jews and through the Jews, to the incarnation of Christ, and the reason he links them, these are the people that took custodianship of the Word of God in evangelism and carried it all the way from Adam through Seth all the way to Jesus Christ and his incarnation. These guys are to be saluted. And you see, that's exactly what, that, what Luke does with that, with that genealogy. It makes it so unique. Yes, you understand what he just did? That's pretty unique. And you know what the theme of, the, of both those covenants is? As far as salvation, it is the gospel. It is a prophetic gospel that Christ is going to come, die on a cross, be buried, and raised from the dead third day. But it was prophetic. He's going to come and do this. Under the old covenant, point two, under the old covenant, people of both dispensations were saved by believing in the prophetic gospel. Isn't that interesting? Both. In other words, you got the Gentile age and you've got the Jewish age until the incarnation. The incarnation brought the Messiah into the historical part, brought him to Israel as prophetic, brought him to Israel, put him on a cross and crucified him. Okay. And see, all of that started with Genesis 3.15. The whole story began there with the fall of Adam and then the angelic conflict over the seed, the seed of the woman. You know, the, the one woman that should be honored in this whole deal is not Mary, it's Eve. It's the first one. And listen, women honored that all the way to Mary. Where did Mary get this virginity idea for Messiah? All these faithful women teaching women, men teaching the word of God, right? And she thought it was normal. She didn't think there was anything about it. And he comes here, oh, well, and she said, whoa, 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 I had no, no baby out of wedlock, buddy. 
salute her for that. But listen, she wasn't, I mean, give her every bit of kudos for that. But listen, the one thing, the, the one that jump started this was Eve. And the women through uh, women like like Sarah, the women along the pike, the, Ra the listen, Matthew's account, the Rahabs, <coughs> right? I mean, they mentioned four women in there. They're all, and that, listen, it tells you the honor of the women out of this thing with Eve, the honor of the women to keep the line pure. It's just, to me, it's just phenomenal. It's just phenomenal. And you, to me, if you're going to honor one, if you're going to honor the last one over here, then salute all the others that carried it. Now, they give the males genealogy, of course, but Matthew, he broke that tradition, didn't he? I mean, he, he saw what I'm just telling you and thankful for him that I see now that importance. <clears throat> you know, God tried to tell Abraham that. He was so hard, so hard about this thing. This bullheaded, I guess. God told him, look, you keep making mistakes. This barrenness, this and this is, I mean, I got it. I've got it. Don't, you're sweating stuff that's out of your, is it out of your control? Yes. It's not out of mine. You think because something's out of your control that it's out of mine. That's not the way it works. It's true in your life and mine too. It, when things get out of control, it makes us nervous. But listen, stop right there in your tracks. Change your mind. Because it's not out of control of God. But God had told Abraham that he and Sarah were going to have a baby. And so he, he keeps going, well, she's still, she, she can't have one. What do you mean she can't have a baby? Well, we couldn't have one th when she was 30. Couldn't have one when she was 40. Couldn't have one when she was 50. Couldn't have one when she's 60. We couldn't have one when she's 70. I think I'm getting the point. No, you ain't got the point. Who's in control? Is there anything? Here's what you don't understand, Abraham. Is anything impossible with God? Well, apparently there are some things. See, that's where you're wrong. See, that's where you're wrong. Well, that's proved out in my life to be that. Well, it doesn't, listen, we don't run off what's proved and not proved in your life. We run off what's proved and not proved in the Word of God. Who are? <laughs> oh, my goodness. The prophetic gospel. Christ would come, die on a cross, be buried and raised on the dead from the, on the third day. And, and you know what he says? According to the scriptures. I, you know, for, I, I, I quote this all the time. You, you wouldn't believe it. how many people... Uh, are, are uh, object to me using 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. They don't think that's necessary. They think that if you, if you just preach that Christ died for your sins, you're okay. I told them, yeah, but three guys did. And they don't like that. They don't want to hear it. But anyhow, it, it doesn't matter. It's just my mail. I mean, I can handle my mail. But it says according to the scriptures. And most of them think, every time they see scriptures in the New Testament, they think they're talking about New Testament. See? Thank goodness you people know better. According to the scriptures. Okay? So we understand when we talk about it, we're talking about, we're talking about the Old Testament scriptures that document that Christ must come. Now, where would that be? Isaiah, Isaiah 52, 53. Isaiah, listen, whoa. I'm going to lay down some passages here, um, in general passages, out of Psalms. I mean, David, David, I mean, you might as well, you know, everybody says, well, Psalms is a hymn book. Let me tell you what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a messianic theology book. I mean, they're singing praises because they, they've, got, they've got the message of the cross. The gospel. Scriptures, Isaiah, listen, when you go to Isaiah 52, 13 through Isaiah 53, 12, it'll blow your mind uh, about him dying on a cross. When you go to Psalms 2, 7, 16, 10, uh, 
it's going to be quoted by Paul in Acts 13, 32 to 35, along with Psalms 22. My God, my, listen, he's quoting out of Psalms like crazy on the cross. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Peter and John before the Sanhedrin in Acts 4, 10 through 12, I wrote it because I think, I think their, their witness in court for Christ was magnificent. This is supreme, supreme. They called before the Supreme Court. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel. They represented the Supreme Court. The Sanhedrin represented all the people of Israel. That's why they said that. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, boy, he stuck a pin in him there that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. That was the guy that got healed previously, right? That, that they were upset about. He, Jesus Christ the Nazarene, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone, and there is salvation and no one else, for there was no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. <laughs> I mean, the Supreme Court, what, what's your defense going to be? What's your defense going to be? What kind of a, a team do you have? Well, I'm going in with the Bible and defend the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, isn't that good? And you know what he quoted? He quoted Psalms 118.22. Daniel refers to it. We talked about that in Daniel 2, the big rock or stone. Is, it, it deals with the second coming. You know what you just see? You just see, here are missionary evangelists. They're no hiding this one, man. They ain't no hiding this one. Well, you're going you're gonna to come to court. We're going to have our say. What do you say? Boom! That you need to be saved. Let all Israel know that Christ is, the Messiah has come. He's died on the cross, was buried, raised from the dead. And you can be saved if you believe it. Now what you want to do? What's it? Court's over. <laughs> I mean, who, whose court did he claim that day? John and Peter went into the court of God. Let it stand as the judge. I stand under his judgment any day as opposed to yours. <laughs> Did you love that? Listen, when I worked with Mr. Graham, it don't matter what they ask him. If they ask him, what's the weather going to be like? He took him to Jesus Christ. Well, what about the politics? They took him to Jesus Christ. What about, I, it doesn't matter. Whatever they ask him, they were always asking him, you going to run for uh, governor? You going to run for president? You going to, I mean, you know, the media, they've always been that way. He loved it. He'd just go like, well, that's a very good question, and here is the answer. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> he never wavered. They never got him one time that I knew of. Boom. Yes, I have something to say to you today, and the people of America <laughs> would, we be, would we be that bold? I hope so. I hope so. If you're bold... In the little meetings, you'll be bold in the big ones. Here's the third point. The Gentile age was divided in two divisions of custodianship of the word of God evangelism. Sometimes we miss that in the age. The age of the Gentiles would divide in two sections. The flood separated them. The first section of custodianship of the Gentile age was with the, the, the uh, Seth, the Sethites. That went from Adam to Seth to Noah. You can read about those heroes in Genesis 5. World evangelism, world missionary evangelism by the Sethites occurred, listen to me, because the world was one language. Made their life pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, 
isn't it good, Rick, when you go, go to a foreign nation that has so many dialects, right? So many dialects, and you find somebody that can understand English. You sit down with a group of students or somebody, there's a hundred of them sitting in there, and you can, you can speak to them in English. I mean, you, you think you have died and gone to heaven. It's, it's, you know, because you, when you have an interpreter, you never know what they're telling. You have no idea. I mean, you hope. You have no idea. I mean, he could be telling them anything. That, that, would, ooh, that would drive me nuts. In, in Genesis 11, 1, it says, Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. In other words, they ran the same alphabet. Then we got the flood. The second section of custodians of the Gentile age was the Shemites. Goes from Noah to Shem to Abraham. You know what's interesting? In the first one, we know a couple, well, there's a couple guys. I mean, and God, and, and the Bible talks about them. The scriptures talks about out of the first section of the Gentile age. Listen, there's two guys that, that the scriptures talk about. Uh, Noah and Enoch, right? Jude 14, 15, I think somewhere, somewhere in Jude. I probably wrote it on a paper somewhere. Somewhere in Jude. Um, Noah, you know, I just read that in 2 Peter 2, 5, a preacher of righteousness. And um, Enoch is mentioned in, um, it's Jude 15, I think, something like that. Uh, and then also he's mentioned in Hebrews 11, 5 and 6. But you know what? 14? Okay, 14. Uh, in, um, in the second section of the Gentile age, which goes from Noah to Shem to Abraham, um, the nations, now we have nations out of Genesis 4. We ha now we have nations. We have 70 nations with different languages and dialects. And now we have foreign missions. B before, we just called them home mission or where you went because everybody was saying, now we call them foreign missions. And that was due to what we call the Tower of Babel. And it, and, and it reads in Genesis 11, 9, Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the languages of the whole earth and from there the Lord scattered them ab abroad over the face of the earth. So now we have foreign missions uh, and it will be the normal standard to the end. The normal standard. Now, when we come to the Jewish age, say, I'm trying to cover the old covenant here tonight. When we come to the Jewish age, Matthew does something really interesting. Matthew 1, 1 through 17, divides the Jewish age into three sections. And I, I found that to be very interesting. Now, th there's a lot, of, a lot of difficulty for some people because they don't really pay that much attention uh, to, to, to history because there's so much reading in the Old Testament to get. But he uses, uh, uh, turn, turn to Matthew 1 and look at verse 17. He divides them into three sections of what he calls 14 generations each. Because I don't think I wrote that one down in your paper. Uh, but in verse 17, right? And, oh, did I, did, I, did I type it out? Oh, yeah, I did that. But I meant, did I type out 117? Uh, forget it. Here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put your eyes on verse 17. Okay, you, got you got verse 17? So he's going to show you. We're going to go from Abraham uh, uh, Abraham to um, David, 14 generations. Then we're going to go from David to the Babylonian captivity, 14 generations. Then we're going to go from the Babylonian captivity to Christ, to the Messiah, to Christ, 14 generations. Agreed? So see how he divided, he divided the Jewish age into three sections of 14 generations each to get you to the incarnation. Are you with me? Now, and then he, he, um, he goes ahead and he lists them, right? It is in this genealogy, 
in that first section, uh, uh, is it, no, I think it may go to both, well, any, I think, well, anyhow, that, that's where he mentions, what, four women in the first section, like of, from verses um, one through six. The, is, there, is there any women mentioned beyond that? I forgot to look. I mean, we got, um, well, we start with Rahab. Mary. Uh, uh, Mary. Yeah, is there, any, is there any other women mentioned past six? Do you see any? Well, it's all right. Let's see. We got we got Rahab, Ruth. We got Rahab, Ruth, and um, and and uh, and then David's wife, Uriah's wife, and that how she's described. That would be um, Bathsheba, right? And then and then Mary, I, I, right? So we would have. Um, Well, that's interesting. Got, we got four. And I guess they're all mentioned in the first section. Okay. All right. Um, we're, we've already talked about Galatians 3. That's how Abraham got saved. How did he get saved? Gospel. A prophetic gospel. Um, look what I did for you on David to the Babylonian captivity. I took David. I just took David in his writing of Psalms the Psalms that he wrote and, and look, these are all messianic Psalms 2, 8, 16, 22, 31, 40, 41, 69, 72, 110. And then you have this great passage, 113 through 118, which, which uh, is, you know, they sung at the last supper and all that business. I mean, these are powerful. These are powerful and they're, they're all messianic. They're all going to tell you, Something unique and different about Christ. And listen, he's got to fulfill all this stuff. <laughs> I mean, you just go down the list and, well, did he do that? Well, yeah, did he do that? Yeah, did he do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just if you just took Psalms and did he do all that? Yeah. Well, guess what? You got the prize. <laughs> the Babylonian to Christ. That takes us to the incarnation, to his actual historical death, burial, and resurrection, ascension, and sessions. And that's the four gospel in Acts 1 and 2. They're gonna, that's, that's the history of it. If you want to study the incarnation of Christ, you go through the four gospels and through uh, Acts 1 and 2. Because you've got an incarnation. He's got to be born to die. He's got to die to be buried. He's got to be buried to be raised from the dead. Then he has the ascension and then session before we can ever get to the church age. You, you guys are so smart. I'm hard, I'm hard pressed every week. I am hard pressed every week because of you people. I got this morning. I, I got a couple minutes. I know this happened. I'm not the only guy this ever happens to. But at four o'clock this morning, I woke up. I was wide awake. You know what wide awake is at four o'clock. I mean, there was no way I could go back to bed. There was no way. I mean, I was ready. I mopped the floors or something. I mean, I am up. And I looked at the clock. I honestly thought it was 6. I usually feel that way at 6. I looked at the clock, and I went, it's 4 o'clock. It's 4 o'clock. Now, Father... I think I should go back to bed for about two. So let me set aside the bed a moment and let me see if you can rock me to sleep here. <laughs> now lay me down to sleep. I could have rocked for an hour. It was not, I mean, I was wide awake. I know that's a God thing. Because that's that has nothing to do with me. Okay, I sleep. I usually don't have a problem. Put my head on the pillow and shake me to get me up. So I got up, fix me a cup of coffee because I'm gonna be up. Man, no, no way. I might go back to bed when it's time to get up, right? But I ain't going back to bed now. So I go downstairs now and, and boy. 
I mean, two and a half hours went by. I had no idea. I mean, what a time with the Lord. And you know this stuff. I mean, I'm not telling anybody in this room don't know this stuff. But I know when I get woke up at 4 o'clock and I'm wide awake, God's up to something. And, and the first part of my time awake, I just kept waiting for the phone to ring. That's happened to me as a pastor. I'd get up, couldn't go back to bed. I said, well, I'll just sit up here and do a little studying or something. And um, phone would ring at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, and, and, and I needed to be up and awake. I didn't need to be half, half asleep trying to talk to somebody. I went downstairs and cranked it out, and I, I just, I got so caught up in it. it you know, kind of like what you might do if you turned on TV and got in a good movie, you know, and you pulled the quilt up, your little cover, and you went, oh, this is so good. Well, that was me, that was me. and I just went, this better, I, when I went down, I told him, I said, I, and I shouldn't, I get in trouble for this stuff, I said, this better be good. I mean, this better be good. <laughs> Like I, like it's like, yeah, well, like it wouldn't be you dummy. But I don't know. He puts up with us, doesn't he? He's a good friend. He's a good friend. The priest nation of Israel was the custodian of the word of God evangelism. I, I, I am going to sleep good tonight. I can tell you that. I, you see how far I'm leaning on this? <laughs> I mean, I guess I know. I mean, I'll be there, buddy. I'll be there. <laughs> oh, geez. The priest nation of Israel was, don't, don't call me tonight about anything, all right? The priest nation of Israel was the custodian of the word of God and evangelism. Exodus 19, 6, they are the priest nation, then Isaiah 42, 49, and of course, Matthew 28. Their failure, <clears throat> their failure led to the church age ambassadorship taking over full responsibility of the gospel and haven't, ha haven't our ancestries in the church, the Gentile ancestries converted to Christ, have, have they not done a, a job to bring it to us the way we've got it? I, we, we, I mean, you know, I can only thank the people back to far, how far back I can get this touched my life. But think about all of them that have touched each other's life as far back as you can think and get. Boy. We, I, I, I put some bold print for you. I would really like to have you take a serious read on your own now. I really think this is important to you uh, because I'm going to get out of here tonight, okay, if you don't mind. You, you all know John 1, 11 through 13. You probably won't need to read that. It might be good, but I want you to read Matthew 21, 42 through 46, and then I want you to go to Acts 13, 46 through 52, and 28, 28. Because this is really important to who we are as a church. I mean, that the progression there from Jesus and John 1 and Jesus and Matthew 21 to his church. Now listen to me. The first two are Jesus and Israel, but the last two is Christ the head of the church and the church in the world. And see how the church struggled and what they finally came up to and how effective that choice has been in human history itself. Uh, that I know Kurt Kniep is doing a great job uh, telling you how important Christ was to world history uh, and the Christian church. Um, so... Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, for those who are visiting with us uh, by internet, we thank you too. And so we'll close in this word of prayer. Let us pray that we will be good ambassadors for Christ. Great ambassadors have brought us great truth. It's our turn to stabilize our generation and train well for the next generation to take responsibility until the Lord comes. So our Father, we're thankful tonight for this opportunity to revisit history, 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ and missionary evangelism. For some of us, and we're all missionaries, some of us are home missionaries, some of us are home and foreign, some are foreign. We're thankful for all of that. This is a wonderful thing, Father. Even this church here has sent foreign missions, foreign missionaries. We have teams that go out to the foreign field. But we're all home missionaries. We care about deeply those who, as Horton says, enter our six feet of responsibility. I'm thankful for a church like that. I pray that would be true for everyone. Listen, it doesn't matter how many people join you. You are an ambassador within yourself, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. When this prayer is over, those who are on the Internet, you might look that up and take responsibility after you understand the gospel and salvation. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him.